So you've got an example here, SLETS, first name and table, where state is New York. On a row-based system, you'd have to read these entire rows here. Whereas for a comment-based system, you only need to worry about two particular columns. So it's about reducing the amount of data you're having to read when there's large amounts of data involved. Inserts, not so pretty, you have to add to every single column file in the system. So that can be a little more painful uh, to deal with. We have ways around that with Ruby Console, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, that can be a performance penalty. Updates, though, are a little bit easier. Actually, colors didn't quite come out here. But uh, if you wanted to update, say, an age, the age column, a value in the age column, for a row-based system, you would have to rewrite the whole row or uh, to over a new row, something like that. For a column-based system, you literally just have to update the column, the column file. So it makes things a little bit simpler for updates. Then deletes again a bit more painful because you have to delete every single item from every single column that is involved. And again, there are ways around this. You can do things like um, partitioning and just drop an entire partition, all sorts of things like that. If you want to change the chain structure, adding a column, deleting a column, this becomes almost an atomic operation because you're literally just adding a file, deleting a file, instead of rewriting out the entire table. There are several workarounds for this. Um, I know the NADB, but um, this becomes a much simpler operation. So why use it? Basically, the MariaDB Com Store um, is designed to deal with very, very large data sets, especially when you want to do large amounts of aggregation or large amounts of filtering. Uh, it's optimized for uh, star schema in particular, uh, so we use uh, hash joins, uh, etc. And we actually have very rapid bulk data insertion rates. Traditional uh, MLTP, uh, smaller data sets, kind of typically you'd use less than a terabyte. Uh, more basic queries, we have like very large joins of very, very large aggregates, you um, tend to get quite slow. Uh, you'd have to have large indexes and things. Um, and if you have lots of DML queries, OLTP is a lot better for that kind of thing. Whereas uh, columnar storage is better for more uh, data warehousing, archive, or that kind of thing. So one particular customer we have uh, at Three Week Operation is IHME. They actually have uh, the health data, in fact, it's uh, death records for uh, millions and millions of people all over the planet. And they use this to work out trends on uh, various illnesses and various uh, things going on like that. You can actually go to their website right now, uh, if you just Google search for IHME, you can see it. The website is actually live generated from a MariaDB Com Store instance, um, and you can view health maps, all sorts of interesting visualizations like that. So, a little bit more about MariaDB Com Store. It started in 2010 uh, as a product called InfinityDB. Uh, and uh, InfinityDB before that was actually uh, an appliance based system, they turned it into software essentially. Um, Calpont, uh, the company who created it, uh, was called Infinity B. Uh, unfortunately, they closed now, and um, Sky School at the time uh, was just going through transition to being called Marine um, We kind of said we're going to support the Infinity B customers. 
Uh, but there were so many patches and things that we were kind of building onto this uh, to fix bugs for customers that we decided to create our own product. And so we call it really the Uh and Later that year, I joined and jumped straight onto the console project. I started as a senior engineer and went all the way up. Uh, December 2016, we launched our first GA, which was kind of Infinity, really 10.1, lots of bug fixes and several improvements. 10.2, we had um, a way to really be Postal 1.1. We had uh, APIs uh, for bulk writing, so you could write in C, Python, Java, a few other things uh, directly into Comp Store. Uh, we had even more kind of improvements. Um, then our Web2 release was massive. Uh, it used ReadyB 10.3. We had the time data type, which we never had before, uh, microsecond support. Uh, used to find analytical functions both in ReadyB and in Cold Store, um, and lots of extra features like that. Uh, so last month we uh, finally got to the point where we could actually bundle Cold Store with ReadyB. We've done this from ReadyB Enterprise to start with because uh, our release schedule's been quite high for ReadyB uh, uh, Community Edition. So before this, we had a fork of ReadyB because we had to kind of lie to the optimizer about certain things. But we were working with the ReadyB server team to have um, special handling calls so we, had to, we could get rid of all of this extra code we were bundling on to really begin to make this work. So Reading Enterprise 10.4 now includes uh, Cold Store 1.4, so we've got what we call convergence for this. Uh, we've got a few more data types, we've got S3 storage backend, so uh, you can effectively use S, uh, Amazon S3 uh, for cheaper storage with a small cache uh, locally, um, and many, many performance improvements. So Cold Store 1.2 uses the fork of Reading 10.3. 1.4 is included in Readme Enterprise 10.4, and it can be built on Readme Community 10.4. Um, I will send out instructions on the mailing list on how to do this. I haven't got around to that yet because we've been so busy with the release itself. 1.5, which we're working on right now, uh, is intended to be included with the Community and Enterprise Edition of Readme. Um, there is actually a pull request to do this right now. Um, I think there's a few things we need to uh, clean up first before it actually gets merged. So it may not make it to the beta release of 10.5, but um, it's very soon to be included. So uh, the things to make things a lot faster with Comstore, Store, we've got this uh, thing called extended animation. So each column is broken up into 8 million row, uh, or I mean items of data. And there is some metadata going on with it uh, to store the minimum and maximum values of that 8 million rows. So if we've got a query here, select item, some quantity from all those which date, tweak your dates, group by item, uh, we can see straight away, percent one uh, is within those dates, so yeah, we're going to query that. Extent two, that date range isn't there, and extent three, that date range isn't there. So before we even ask the database if there's anything, the metadata just eliminates those straight away, so we're not even reading that data. And then we only care about those three columns. So those are the only three column files we're actually going to actually read from the disk um, or from our LIU cache. So if you've got a huge amount of data here, we've eliminated it down to three eight million row files. So it's a great way of eliminating uh, huge amounts of data down to very small uh, result sets. Cold store is massively parallel, so we have these concepts of user modules and performance modules. They are terribly named, but um, there'd be a lot of debate on renaming this, and they never, we never got around to it. So essentially, a user module is a ReadyB server and a plugin and a few extra processes. Um, what this will do is break up the query into lots of primitive job steps. Um, so uh, a join would be uh, a primitive job step, and then uh, aggregates and so on. These are all chained together. Um, these are sent to performance modules, which uh, actually know about their own data. There's a shared nothing storage below it. So 
a join would be uh, sort of a, a basic query would be broken up to query uh, all the extents individually. So basically, a single query can use all the processes on every node simultaneously. This does mean if you're running like 20 queries at once, you're going to find the performance impact on those queries because every query is trying to use all the resources of the system at the same time. But it does mean that we can scan data extremely fast. Um, so to make sure that everything lines up, we have fixed width columns, one by two by four by eight by. We're working on larger columns so we can deal with larger decimal formats, etc. For anything bigger than eight by, we have a concept of dictionary structure. So we've got essentially an eight by pointer and uh, a kind of flat file just full of data, so the pointer just points to where the data is. So if we go to bar charts, blobs, etc., those go in the dictionary file. And this means that we can very easily figure out with some basic maths, say uh, for row three, that's a two byte field, we know straight away where on four byte field where row, the extra part of row three would be. It's quite a simple way of uh, doing the calculations there. So the extent map, this metadata I was talking about, um, contains an object ID, so every column, uh, dictionary file, etc., is an object uh, table that also has an object ID. Uh, the object type, the, we use logical block IDs for everything's on a cake a kilobyte block level. Uh, so the start and the end of a given extent. Uh, the minimum value and maximum value stored in that extent. For instance, this is easy to figure out. Um, bar charts and stuff, it's usually the uh, first eight bytes. Uh, the width of the column itself, uh, the DB root, so DB root is essentially a partition, you can have multiple partitions per uh, node. Um, and then we've got a partition ID, second ID, and offset. This is essentially figuring out the extent number and the file and name. And then we've got a concept called a hybrid watermark. Now, this is quite useful for bulk inserts. Essentially, what it is, it's uh, a pointer to the end of the file to be read. So when we do bulk inserts, we just append data onto the extents, add new extents, etc. On commit, we move this hybrid watermark and say, this is where the end of the file is now. On a rollback, we don't move it. So it makes it a little easier to figure out where the end of the data actually is, which means essentially we are recommitted isolation level. So on the disk storage, we have the extent, uh, which is taken in rows, so 8 megabytes or 64 megabyte. Um, the second file uh, it contains two extents uh, for some reason, that's just the way it really did it, we haven't changed that. Uh, it's compressed into four megabyte chunks using snappy compression, um, and inside that there are the 8 kilobyte blocks. Uh, so it can compress down very, very well, especially if you've got quite a lot of sequential data in the column. We use hash joins, so it's great for equality joins, uh, not so great if you're not doing equality joins. No indexes and columns are what's <coughs> uh, Try and add a primary key, you'll get an error. Uh, basically, extent map elimination is our equivalent of an index. Um, so there is in since you've got these column files, these extent files, they're essentially our indexes in themselves, so they, we don't really support indexes. Uh, multi threaded joins, multi threaded aggregates. Um, people keep saying that really means multi threaded, but well, we already have it. Um, bot writes, we've got a tool called CP import, which reads for CSV. CSV. Uh, we have, we support load data in file, insert select, all of that kind of, kind of stuff. Uh, and that's all very fast. DML writes in Com Store are very slow. At the moment, we use a uh, concept of uh, an undo log, which means that every time you change a column, we have to uh, copy the old block into the undo log, sync it, write the new data into the new column, sync it, and this can be an extremely slow process. Especially since uh, a lot of the data is at local, so you've got a lot of hops there as well going on. Uh, and every query is going to try and use every core on the system. We have a concept, oh sorry, yeah. So let's say you have four worker nodes with four cores, that means what will you use 16 cores? Yes. Four? Yeah, assuming the data is on all, uh, yeah. spread across all the nodes, yeah. 
it will be tried using the 16 cores for uh, the query. And yeah. uh, <laughs> you mentioned to use a snap to write the operation. Is that the only operation support? Or do you use like a it's the only one supported at the moment. We are looking, it's just uh, the question is just snapping, compression, and compression. It's the only one at the moment. Uh, if PDP had another one which was proprietary, so we have to approve that. It is very easy for us to add another compression algorithm. We're looking at um, LZ4, for example. Yeah, I'm looking at LZ4 has an internal like a very easy Yeah, exactly. LZ4 is really, really, uh, looking yeah. really good recently. So. Uh, and then you said you have extended <coughs> illumination, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in so, uh, if any extent, do you have a data sorted in any way? Or is it, uh, no, data is not sorted. Uh, it's uh, natural. It's natural order that the data goes into. Okay, so, so I see. And then for extent elimination, do you have a, uh, you know, a, any group uh, yeah, boom filters, right, or uh, whatever other uh, tools? We don't have boom filters yet. Um, again, that's something we we look into. Um, in particular, the dictionary. Yeah, well, I think like, there's also to this, like, we have like a meets and max value, right? So you can skip that value. So you don't have that feature. No, we would just say that we already got the min and max to, to filter on the moment. Well, then, we already got the min and max value. Oh, on every column, right? Sorry? On every column. On every extent of every column. Yeah, on every, every extent, extent of every column. Yeah. So that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you define the number of parallelism? Is the integration to run just one query at a time, the whole cluster? Uh, so you, the, the question is, can you find the parallelism? Um, you, it, we can, but it's very difficult. Because uh, if, if we have a concept of a thread pool, and it just basically tries to consume the thread pool. Uh, so there are some settings you can change. But you would have to restart the entire cluster every time you change your settings. Okay, so not like a rapid select parallel four or something like that. No, but you can change the priority of the query. Yeah. Um, I, honestly, I can't remember how to do that because it's been so long since anyone's asked how to do that. <laughs> but you can make some queries higher priority than others inside the system, and they will get a uh, high, high priority in the thread pool. So the typical pattern is not to run too many queries at the same time. Exactly, you don't want to run too many queries at the same time. Okay. And in fact, if you try to run more than 20 queries at once, it will uh, start stacking them up. Yeah. Um, because it's just too many threads running at the same time. Because if you, if you uh, think about how it works, say you've just got a simple select and aware condition, and so you've got, um, say, 50 odd extent, it will break that up into 50 jobs to be run in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just with uh, a simple select that you then got, so you've got hash join or something like that as well. That then breaks it up into more pipeline jobs that we create hash buckets based on the number of cores, and then that's going on. And then aggregates again, we have uh, buckets for aggregation. Um, so all of this is happening. And then we pipeline everything as well. We've got FIFO buffers between every step, so all these steps can run in parallel and one feeding into the next step. So there's parallelization going on in lots of different forms. Do you have a recommendation of size of data set where it starts making sense? Uh, size based where it starts making sense. Uh, I would say 100 to gigabytes where it starts making sense, um, definitely. Uh, if you, I mean, we can run on a gigabyte of data, but it only would probably be faster. So, you know, but yeah, in our tests, we use like a, a gigabyte of data when I'm demoing on small systems. You kind of need um, a lot of cores and a lot of RAM really for this, so we can cache a lot of data. Um, and also, joins and aggregates execute in memory, so the more RAM you have, the better for that. We can split onto disk for joins, uh, we can't get for aggregates. So um, it's best to have a lot of RAM in both the UM and the VM. The UM can, can be on the same physical system. You can run it with one single machine. Um, in fact, we do this in uh, SkySQL right like, now. Um, so. I think I was about this one. You get the CPU and memory for, for another machine. So if you are running a DB, you would be lot of stuff. You don't want to twice the buffer for that because you want to drive it. So these case, I call them on the same server. Mm -hmm. And run that, it would be much faster. Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically, yeah. Uh, the more, <coughs> excuse me, the more you can give it, the faster it will go, basically. And then you mentioned that uh, you have uh, in, uh, in memory, you can spill out some of our right? So you have to tune 
uh, what is max memory, or what is just uh, for, for spill to disk? No, no, you said there's sort of things you cannot just build. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we have um, it looks by default it looks at how much system RAM there is and allocates a percentage of that mm -hmm. as the maximum amount of RAM. So for the PMs, the uh, it'll actually use that as a, a bit like the MMU bubble, you know, for maximum. So, so, so it's optimizing and it's is it shared? Uh, is it shared by all queries or just one? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it very very shared by all queries? Okay, so it's not like it's nice all the sort of buffer size. No, 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 no. It's it's uh, yeah. We've we've got this um, accounting system to make sure that uh, you don't overflow that kind of memory too much. It doesn't include uh, network buffers though, so. Um, we allow, we don't let you set the percentage to 100% because then you won't have any space left for metal buffer. Uh, but it's still um, a good way of kind of publishing the system. It figures out if you've got U and PM combined, it will give, say, 50% of the RAM to the LIU, 25% of the RAM to aggregates and joins, and then you've got 25% for, say, you know, UV or anything else running on the system. Uh, by default, you can change all this quite easily, and you can get fixed numbers. So, if you're running on uh, Kubernetes, for example, uh, it can lie about how much RAM you have in the system. So, we, we support fixed numbers as well for that. Uh, so, Cross Engine Joints is a system that's kind of unique to Cold Store. Uh, if you want to join with an NODP table, we actually do this inside Cold Store rather than inside ReDB Server. We do this by making a connection back to MariaDB and querying for the InnoDB data, and then it runs it through our hash join algorithm. Um, so it's designed for using small pivot tables inside of InnoDB, um, where data could change quite a lot. Um, and essentially, it's uh, running from a local process loops like that. It's probably not the best way to do things, but it's uh, pretty efficient. Yes. Network recommendation, but it will be tools and it will be taking a bit preferably, yes, uh, for network. Uh, and you say uh, it's going to be merged in my and mod. Yes. Right? And uh, in this case, and does it mean it will use uh, uh, the same uh, parser, mm -hmm. right? So it will be a complete uh, syntax compatibility, or is it going to essentially, uh, you know, steal the. So, yeah, if we do use Ruby's parser and we support a lot of the syntax. There are certain, so there's certain data types that console doesn't support and you'll get an error if you try and use those. Uh -huh. uh, we have our own DDL parser right now. Okay. Uh, so DDL essentially gets repubs um, because there's some special syntax to change per column compression and things like that. Um, but that will go away uh, eventually. Probably not the 10.5, but... Well, I wonder if more is for uh, select, uh, select... Select, yeah. Right, select. so wherever it's going to be like some advanced CTE functions, uh, right, right, or uh, some built-in functions which my read and then five has, all of those... Yeah, all, 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 all definitely pass, mm -hmm. but things that we can't support internally, we'll error say we can't support them. So we support CTEs, for example, mm -hmm. we don't support recursive CTEs, uh -huh. so we try to recursive CTE. Our engine would say, sorry, we don't know how to I see, I see. So they will and you'll get beautiful error. So not everything will support it, but you'll get an error message. Okay. Exactly, yeah. I suppose we do that in the upper level if you uh, need to support uh, We don't do it the upper level yet, no. Not for that one, not for CTAs. You can do it for that, you know, that cases. Uh, some other cases, yeah. Function, yeah. passing. Yeah. So the idea of the is that uh, you be the uh, first part is an upper level, mm -hmm. then the column store will send it to the column store, which can say that can I do it or not. Okay, yeah. And if you, if you can't do it, it does it, if not the upper level should do it. It yeah. doesn't know why the other function is not uh, doing that. Yeah, but I think in some cases, I think that's, uh, uh, I've seen that implementation is somewhere in T7 and right? Because if you look at the uh, upper level, do that, it's kind of, you know, NASA loops on the column store, it's you better. <laughs> Not yeah. good, right? So yeah. if there's anything we say yeah. we, if there's anything we say we can't support, yeah. we have this thing called a select handler, it's quite new in Ruby. You can turn the select handler off yeah. um, and then it will use Comstore as a basic engine just doing the uh, read row uh, oh, okay. event. That is extremely slow. 
we don't recommend doing that. Um, that we really that's the same thing, that case will drive again an error yeah. instead of use or something. Exactly, so, so by default you'll get an error, you can switch it back into slow mode, and then we'll actually get okay. okay. But yeah, uh, so there are certain functions, basically every function in ReadyB has we have to re-implement because they have to execute in the PM nodes. So if there's a function we have re-implemented, like some of the JSON functions, you would get an error, um, things like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's everything I had. Uh, it works 2020. I've got a slide for that for some reason. Uh, <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much.